Well, welcome to the Toledo Police Museum. My name is Shirley Green. I am a retired veteran of the Toledo Police Department, which I will probably refer to for the rest of this as TPD, because it's a lot quicker. Anyway, I was on the police department for 26 years, and I retired in the early 2000s. I am now director of the Toledo Police Museum. Currently, uh, I teach over at the University of Toledo. I teach early American history and African American history. After I retired, I went back to school. So you guys thinking that you're gonna be done with your school now, you can go back to school. And that's what I did after I retired. And I got my PhD in history. Anyway, I also should tell you that my father was also on the police department. He came on in the 1950s. And I had two uncles who were also on the police department. And they started in the 1940s. All right, so but before we talk about the history of blacks on <clears throat> the Toledo Police Department, I want to talk about the origins of policing in the United States in general. All right, <clears throat> early on, policing in, a, in America was pretty informal, pretty informal. You had elected constables like in New England and New England colonies, and then as the America grew, they wanted to formalize policing. And the way policing was formalized was different in the North and in the South, very different. In the North, the first professional police agency was the Boston Police Department, and it was formed in the 1830s. A lot of people think New York City beat them out. No, Boston was first. New York came really quickly thereafter, and Philadelphia was the third. So you had Boston, New York, and Philadelphia with professional police departments. In the North, policing was basically established after the British model. The British model was uh, really created by Sir Robert Peel in the 1820s. And Sir Robert Peel was a progressive thinker, and he believed that policing should be community-oriented, that police officers should be professional, should be part of, considered part of the community. And he also believed in policing to be preventative, not just reacting to a crime that occurred, but trying to prevent crime from occurring. The other thing that Sir Robert Peel stressed was to have a chain of command in police departments. So you have a chief and then his subordinates, and everyone follows the chain of command. So the police departments in the North were established after that British model. But there is something else that you need to know about policing in the North. Policing in the North wasn't really about crime control early on. It was about social control. It was about trying to control the disorder that people saw in the Northern communities. Okay? So who decides what is disorderly in these communities? Not your average ordinary citizen. It's the people with money the business owners, the bankers, the people that wanted their business and their economic <clears throat> commerce and opportunities to run smoothly, very smoothly. And in order for that, they thought, to do so, they needed to have a formal police agency. So politics early on in Northern policing really dominated the way that police officers react. So we had social control over control, crime control, and eventually that would change over the course of years. But that's how it started in the North, trying to control folks to make sure they go to work the next day, all right? That an immigrant population that these bankers or these business owners employed to work in their, their establishment were able to go then work the next day, that you can control. So that's the North. In the South, it's a whole different uh, manner because some historians will argue that policing in the South, professional policing in the South, started with the slave patrols. Those groups of individuals that were basically charged with capturing fugitive slaves and putting down slave revolts. One of the first large slave uh, patrols were in the 1700s in South Carolina, and then in the early 1820s, Charleston, South Carolina, 
had over 100 officers that worked in their slave patrol, all right? So there's a difference between what's going on in the North and the South. And it's good to have an understanding about the underlying origins of these police agencies because all that stuff just doesn't disappear because we don't talk about it, all right? So I wanted to start with that, the origin of policing in the United States, and then talk about the city of Toledo. Great, great. So in the city of Toledo, which I'm sure you guys already know, uh, it, come about, it come, comes about, excuse me, in 1835 as a result of the Michigan-Ohio War. You can see on our timeline, it's sometimes called the Ohio War because for some reason or another, Michigan and Ohio wanted to fight over Toledo. Anyway, I always tell people that Ohio lost, and that's why Toledo is in Ohio. Don't be mad at me. They, don't they've at all people. heard that in class don't already. Okay. Yeah. Don't <laughs> all right, so uh, Toledo's formed 1836, had a population of 100 people. And what I like to point out here is like most northern uh, cities and urban areas, they had a marshal, a city marshal first, and he basically dealt with volunteer police officers, all right? And then in 1852, they actually established a volunteer police uh, force. They started to pay uh, officers for the night watch. And the night watch was basically because business owners wanted their properties watched at night so they wouldn't be burglarized. So you can see what's driving this train, right? Um, then you also had, in 1862, the city marshal gets the power to deputize men to serve as day and night police officers. Here's a picture of the central station that would be police headquarters. It's on Superior Street, and um, that was where the police officers worked out of. That was where they had a barn to house their police horses. And then in 1867, um, the, the state of Ohio passed something called the Metropolitan Police Law, and that called for a full-time paid police force. That is when the Toledo Police Department, TPD, was officially formed, and we celebrated our 150th anniversary a couple years ago. So 20 years after <clears throat> the creation of the official Toledo Police Department, they hired their first black police officer. And there's a picture of him right here. His name is Albert King. And it's funny, he became the first black police officer during Black History Month, uh, February 1st of uh, 1887. Uh, this picture that you see here of Albert King, it's a picture from the 1900 uh, police yearbook. And at that period of time, in 1900, the city of Toledo had 100 patrolmen, notice I said patrolmen, 11 command officers, and three detectives and only one of them was black, and that was Elbert King. At the turn of the 20th century, um, Toledo's black population had grown to about 1,700. Many of Toledo's black residents were descendants of fugitive slaves who had made their way up through Ohio uh, by way of the Underground Railroad. But here's the deal about Elbert King. That's not how his people got here. Elbert King's from Canada, yes. He immigrated, he was born in uh, Toronto, Canada. Um, he immigrated to, into Toledo in 1867, so he was older when they uh, hired him. Um, and I don't know yet why he immigrated, probably for a better, better uh, livelihood and a, a better way to uh, make a life for himself. But uh, he eventually came here. He gets appointed in 1887. Um, he marries an individual by the name of Julia Ward King, and I'll talk about her in a minute. But what is really interesting about Albert King, and I love, I'll give you a better picture of him. I, I love his uh, handlebar uh, yes. mustache. <clears throat> you look at his face when you have a clearer picture of it. He uh, was also involved in theatrical work. He was a playwright as well. So he wrote plays, and he acted in those plays as part of a small, black troupe of actors. They uh, did plays for the churches. One of their major plays, it's a play about Christmas, it's called The Mistletoe Bow. And uh, it was so well received that he was able to stage it at the Wheeler's Opera House downtown. 
Now, we was opera house, not down there anymore. It burned down in the 1860s, no, late 1800s. Had to be, because he was, he was a police officer there. But uh, 1893, there you go. Anyway, um, he was a playwright. He wrote plays. He acted in plays. Um, so he lived another very interesting uh, life. He was married to an individual by the name of Julia Ward, and she is not on the screen here. She was born enslaved in Kentucky. How did she get to Toledo? Well, she and her family escaped via the Underground Railroad to Canada. And after the end of the Civil War, she and her family, her mom and dad and her siblings, moved back into the United States. They lived in Monroe, Michigan for a period of time. Eventually moved back, moved into Toledo. I shouldn't say back, because they never lived here. Moved into Toledo. And they were living in a boarding house in East Toledo. And you know who else was living in that boarding house in East Toledo? Elder King. And that's how they met. And they got married. After they got married, she becomes the first black woman who was a juvenile court probation officer. And <clears throat> the other really interesting thing about Julia Ward King is she is part of the WPA slave narratives. So her story is online. I'll send that link to you. Yes. And it talks about how she and her mother and her siblings escaped from Kentucky to uh, Canada. And it's, it's really an interesting story. Um, the other thing that is interesting about Julia Ward King is right before she died, she gave an interview to the Toledo Newsbeat. And in that article, she talks about life in the early 1900s for blacks in the, in the city of Toledo. She says that most African Americans lived in the small village of Manhattan, Ohio. And the first time I heard that, I went, where the heck is Manhattan, Ohio? There's no such animal as Manhattan, Ohio. Well, if I had just stopped a little bit to think, I grew up in the North End, right? Manhattan Boulevard runs from what, LaGrange, all the way up through into Point Place. Yeah. And the area that she is talking about is where Manhattan Boulevard and Summer Street come together. That's Manhattan, Ohio. And that is one of the first black settlements in this region, according to Julia Ward King. But she also talked about the old black schoolhouse that uh, she says was built, excuse me, opened in 1862. It was right along the Miami Erie Canal. The canal used to run right through downtown Toledo. Um, and this black schoolhouse was in the rear of a blacksmith shop. And the way that was able, they were able to open up this colored schoolhouse was because a group called the Toledo Colored School Association had gathered up enough funds to open up the schoolhouse. So that is really an interesting Type take that Julia Ward King is able to give us about black experience early in the city of Toledo. And kind of a reminder that segregation wasn't a oh. southern institutional. No, 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 yeah. no, no, definitely. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But definitely segregation was the issue in the north and the south. And what is really interesting, you're leading me right into what I was going to say. What is interesting about the history of black policing on the Toledo Police Department it parallels the history of African Americans and the rest of society, right? So <clears throat> the history of blacks is a really good book that I use to put all this together. Um, Black Police in America by W. Marvin Dulaney. Great book. And what he does is he separates the history of black policing into a number of different periods. And the first period, um, he, what we're going to talk about is the politics of tokenism right after Albert King comes on, 1890 to the 1930s. And basically, it's on our little board here, basically what was occurring then was black police officers were restricted to working in patrol beats in black communities. So if you were a black police officer, you would not be assigned to work in a predominantly white community. Did not. Um, you were also restricted from arresting white people. Made your job hard. Generally denied any rank above the rank of sergeant. The way the command structure works, 
on the Toledo Police Department, everyone starts as a patrol officer, next rank is sergeant, next rank is lieutenant, then captain, deputy chief, and then chief. So, in, during this period of time, if you were a black police officer, you probably weren't gonna get promoted at all, and then if you were promoted, it was to the rank of sergeant, and that's it, that was the ceiling. Um, generally, by the 1920s, uh, TPD had hired a number of black officers, and TPD was also one of the first departments to hire a black female, and she was hired in 1922. Her name is Esther Cannon Ferguson, and she wasn't a patrol officer or police officer. She was a police woman. Police women did different types of jobs. For the most part, they did not wear uniforms. They wore plain clothes. And they were charged with working with women and children. And one of their duties was to uh, police dance halls. So they would go, yeah, yeah. I could not ever see myself doing this. They would go into a dance hall and make sure the couples weren't dancing too close. That was their job. <laughs> so funny. Anyway, um, so she was hired as well. But on our display here, we have the subtitle Rising Above Tokenism. And some of these African-American police officers back in the day were able to do that. And the first one I want to point out is Ed Harris. And he was appointed as a substitute police officer meaning like a substitute teacher. You just come in when they need you, right? So he was appointed as a substitute officer in 1907. Um, he was hired permanently after that. And he was also the first black to be promoted to the command rank. He was promoted to detective sergeant in 1912. And then two years later, he was promoted to detective lieutenant. Another interesting story here. Ed Harris was an actor and a singer before he became a Toledo police officer. He used to perform in all black musicals on Broadway. Yes, he had an amazing voice, but his voice cracked. He lost his baritone voice and he had to find another way to make a living. Wound up in Toledo, Ohio. He was working at one of the state places, downtown Toledo, and was one of the waiters or service to the then safety director. And the safety director said, you should come on the police department. So that's how he got hired. Um, so he was used to being around celebrities. And the reason I point that out is there's a picture, and I have a better picture in the PowerPoint for you. There's a picture of Ed Harris alongside of the first black heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Johnson. When Jack Johnson was in town, Ed Harris served as his de facto bodyguard. Really cool. That's amazing. That is really cool. And I think people don't understand that Toledo was at the center of a lot of places. Yes. Right? So you look back in history and you see that they had major heavyweight fights and things of that nature. The Jermaine, uh, excuse me, the Jermaine slash Ottawa Park golf course was the first public golf course that was erected or started um, east of New York City. Yeah. Huh. Toledo, Ohio. So, it's an amazing history that we do have here. And um, you have to understand where Toledo is situated. You got Detroit to the north, Columbus to the south, Cleveland, and chi -Town, right? And you're right in the middle. And when you start to talk about the prohibition period during, uh, that's why we were so active in the prohibition era. So here is Ed Harris along with Jack Johnson. And he stayed on the police department for many, many years. All right, so moving on. Another part of our separate but equal era is the story of Officer Jake Chandler. Um, Jake Chandler is the only officer in, um, in our museum here that has his own individual exhibit. And the reason that is, is because he is the only officer to have been killed in war while a member of the Toledo Police Department. He was on leave when he signed up to go serve in World War II. But before we talk about his service, I wanna talk about his personal story, his backstory first. Because Jake Chandler and his family are part of the Great Migration story. Those groups of African Americans that were leaving the South trying to look, look for a better life for themselves, for their families, a safer life, 
for themselves and their family, get away from the violence in the South that was being perpetrated against them. And Jake family, excuse me, Jake Chandler and his family were part of that great migration. When they moved up here, they moved into a predominantly black community. But when Jake went to high school, he went to a predominantly white high school at the time. That was Scott High School. Scott High School was in an upper middle class neighborhood. If you ever go through the old West End, you see those old houses. That's why. That's why. A lot of wealthy people live there and their children went to Scott High School. And so did Jake Chandler. And Jake Chandler was a very popular individual at Scott High School. He was captain of the track team. As you can see, we have a picture of him looking very serious there. Very serious there as a member of the track team. But his family's move to Toledo, Ohio was very beneficial for Jake because he not only went to Scott High School, he also went to and graduated from the University of Toledo. He was also a member of the UT, um, then TU, Toledo University, track team. Um, and he was very well liked on the campus of the University of Toledo. I'm gonna to read a quote from the UT uh, yearbook. And it says, <coughs> Jake Chandler is an able president of the group and is tops around school in athletics and maintains a high honor rating. His high jump record is one of which the whole student body is proud. His congenial personality and winning smile place him in the minds of the students. Place him in the minds of the students. He was just very, very well liked. He was the president, excuse me, he was the vice president, I think, and then president of a group of individuals called the Olympus Club. The Olympus Club was a group of black athlete scholars, slash scholars, um, that was really charged with trying to recruit black students, black athletes to the University of Toledo during that period of time. And Jake Chandler was a member of that group, which I was stunned I to hear that. about that group. And I remember talking to an individual who was a little older than me. And I said, have you ever heard of the Olympus Club? Said, yeah. Come, no one talks about this stuff. Yeah. So anyway, um, he was an office holder of the Olympus Club. He graduated from the University of Toledo, Bachelor of Education, wanted to teach. Um, he got in, employed by the city of Toledo in the recreation department. And then not too long after that, he came on the Toledo Police Department. And he was appointed in 19, you got a chief here. That's fine. He was appointed in 19, 40, oh, that's a request for exchange. I'll find it here. Ah, 1941, in September of 1941. <clears throat> and he wasn't on very long. But I'm going to tell you a cute story about Jake Champ. This harkens back to his track days. And I think you might know this story. Yes. Already. All right. He and two of his academy mates, classmates, are walking a beat downtown. And I'm sure as you drive throughout the city of Toledo now, you'll see police cars you know, a line next to each other and the officers are talking back and forth. Police officers do that, they can't help themselves. They see another police officer and they have to talk to them. And that's what Jake Chandler and his two academy mates were doing in downtown Toledo, standing around talking on a street corner. And then finally, I think Jake says, that car just ran a stop sign. And his classmates say, yeah, yeah it did. And Jake gives chase on foot. He chases the car down stops the car and gives the guy a ticket. That's how great he was, that's how fast he was, that's how athletic he was. And his classmates remember that story years later and they told it to a reporter of the Blade years later. But that is just one story about Jake Taylor. There are a lot of them. Um, so he goes into the service. He enlists in November of 1942. He is enlisted as a private. He eventually makes his way up into the ranks of first lieutenant. <clears throat> and he's assigned um, along with his battalion, battalion of the Buffalo Soldiers, to uh, an area in Italy. What is interesting about Jake Chandler and the fact that he is one of the first African Americans to be <clears throat> risen to the rank, promoted to the rank of command. Because remember earlier I said that in the police department, blacks could not get promoted to the rank of sergeant lieutenant. Well, Jake was able to, the same thing held true in the military. And you had these battalions and these groups of enlisted men, privates, who were being commanded by 
white lieutenants and captains. And they started to push to have black command officers supervise them. And Jake Chandler was one of the first who was promoted to the rank of lieutenant. One of the first. And it's interesting because when I was doing research on um, Jake Chandler, um, <clears throat> I came across a book, and in the book the author said, as he talked to veterans of these battalions, they talked about several of the command officers who were excellent. And Captain Gandhi, who was very well known, Charles Gandhi, very well known, of course was at the top of the list, was also was Jake Chandler. Jake Chandler was remembered as being a great command officer as well. So he uh, is serving in Italy, and it's very, very sad story, but um, he dies over there. Um, he steps on a mine and trying to help another a soldier, and he is killed um, in active duty over there in Italy. He is buried there. <coughs> Excuse me, he is buried there. Um, he is buried at the Florence American Cemetery. That is his marker right there. Once the Toledo Police Department <coughs> became aware of his story in the early 2000s, which I don't know why it took so long, <laughs> but I shouldn't say we didn't know about his story, we did, but we decided to recognize that service in the early 2000s. <coughs> so if you go to the Toledo Police Memorial Garden, which is located downtown, between, behind the Municipal Court Building, then you will see this marker that we have uh, that has been dedicated to Jacob Chandler and his service to America. The only thing I'm curious, by the time Chandler's on the force, roughly how many African Americans are serving in the TPD at that point? Oh, wow. You know, I could get you that number. I could get you that number because the way the history of it went, for the most part, and I'm talking from just looking at academy class pictures up to the late, to the six, 1960, 61 classes, there, if they had an African American in the class, there's one. So that's, it's almost, almost like there's one per class. That's what I was curious. I, mean, that, I don't even need a specific number. That's exactly what I was wondering. Yes. It was, it was, so it was fairly rare for a young man like him to get oh, yeah. on the TPD. Yeah, he was the only black in his class. And I don't even have to look at his academy class to know. Yeah. If he was hired in 40 or 41, then he is the only black in his class. I've seen pictures of Jake in his class, and he's, yeah. he's yeah. the only one. When my father came on in 1959, he was the only black in his class. When my uncles came on um, in 46 and 47, they were only black officer in the class. Now, I'm glad you brought this up because this really speaks to the separate and unequal time period of the 40s and 50s and really into the 60s for the most part, is that black men were hired at a rate of one per class. There may be two, but that didn't happen until the 60s. Right? One per class. And when they were interviewed for the job, and I got this from my uncles, they were told that they were gonna work in the black community. That they were told, my one uncle <clears throat> who came on in 1946, and he eventually rose up to the rank of captain, but um, he was told that, all right, can you work on the weekends? And he said, of course, sir, because he wants the job, right? right? He says, of course, sir. He said, because that's when your people act up. So you're going to work on the weekends, at night, and in the black community. That was the mentality. So they always made sure that they hired enough black officers to work and walk in the black community. How many people would have been in a police academy class at that point? Oh, it, it, it changes. The large class we had, I was on staff at that point in time, was right around 130. But okay. for the most part, anywhere from 20 to 30, sometimes okay. smaller than that. So we're definitely talking un way under 10% of the oh, TPD yeah. is African-American at, at this point in the 40s, 50s. Oh, yeah. 20, it, yeah. Well, you think of it this way. In 1900 with Albert King, if there were 100 patrol officers. He's one. one. He's it. Yeah. They have the one. That's all we need. If we have this issue, we'll go send them there. Yeah. And that's the way it worked. And... Um, I'm not gonna say it worked. Um, I'm just gonna say is that is in their minds. That's how they made policing in these communities work sure. for them. It's, it's, and, and what happens when, when you hire like that, then you're always gonna be behind, yeah. right? Yeah. And I said earlier that uh, 
CPD's history of black police officers parallel the rest of society. So during the late 60s and especially into the 70s, in the late 70s, they started to hire more officers of color because that was going on in society. And then things took a turn again. And now you can almost look at, and I remember thinking, looking at some of the police academy classes when they were sworn in recently, saying not, not last couple of classes because they've been really um, well represented, but that's because of some other things that have been going on as well. But for a period of time there, it was like one, two, one. I'm like, are we back to that? Are we going yeah. back to that? So in a lot of, a lot of that is uh, perpetrated by the fact that it's difficult to get people of color to want to be a police officer right now. So we're talking about separate but unequal time period that <clears throat> Jacob Chandler served in. But also during that period of time, there were some things, some positive things that were occurring. And one of those things was the fact that uh, a guy by the name of Roy Shelton was, became the first black police captain. And he was appointed in the 30s to the police department. Um, he was born and raised in Rossford, Ohio, and he went to Wilberforce University, got a degree there. And for some of you that don't know, Wilberforce University is the HBCU that is located in central Ohio. So uh, he was a graduate there. And he would eventually be promoted to detective rank in 1963. So that's kind of slow rolling here, but if you only have a smaller group of people to select from, of course it's gonna be slow rolling. But five years later, and this takes us into the next time period. Five years later, um, a group of black officers, including my uncles and my dad, um, they decided to get together and form their own group. And this time period is called the era of police, excuse me, black police unionism, where you had black police officers, like the civil rights movement that was going on in the mid 60s and the late 60s, it was going on within police departments as well, right? They're feeding off of each other. So you have black police officers coming together and saying, okay, we're gonna form our own group and we're gonna have our own mission statement. And our mission statement, the reason that we wanna to come together is to address issues of discrimination in promotions, in assignments, in discipline, and in hiring, all right? So if you think about assignments, what were they complaining about? Well, they're working still in all black communities. And the other thing is this, <clears throat> up to this point, this separate and un unequal, it's during, especially in the South, the Jim Crow rules, right? Blacks go here, colors go here. Blacks, excuse me, whites can ride on the bus here, blacks have to ride a bus back here. On the Toledo Police Department, the way that looked is number one, black officers worked in black communities. Number two, black officers worked with black officers. The crews, the police units were segregated. You didn't have integrated units. Now you can look out and you see a woman, Latino, black, whatever, working together. It didn't occur that way. And it didn't start to change until the era of black police unionism. So these individuals got together in August of 1968 and they said, hey, we're gonna change this. We're gonna change this. We're gonna make them change it. Well, how do you make powerful entities change things? You just go knock on the door and say, hey, listen, we think we're being treated unfairly. Could you treat us better? And the chiefs and the people in charge, the city father, fathers, nah, we're good because this is working for us. But it wasn't working for those black police officers. So they filed a suit in federal court. And the federal court magistrate, a guy by the name of Don Young, issued a federal court decree mandating that the doors had to be open to blacks and Latinos in the hiring and promotion process. They had to be forced <laughs> to do this. It's really, really interesting because there's, there's, le there's a political level in police departments, right? Sure. So you go to the federal court and get this stuff mandated for you, and then people can get hired and promoted. And then there's a social level, right? So now you're going from all black crews working in all black districts to integrated crews. How does that work now? 
Now, this is just anecdotal, and I don't know if I actually went back and researched how they decided to integrate the crews. I do know anecdotally this. My dad always worked with another black officer, always. Until one day he comes home from, from work and he says, I'm getting a white partner. And we are looking like, what? Because <laughs> that was shocking to us. And I don't even know if he was happy about it. But he says, I'm getting a white partner. And I remember thinking, we're not going to meet this guy, right? Because we always met my dad's partners. And they would pull up in the police car and then they would walk in, yeah, kids, this is my new partner, so and so. Hi, officer, so and so. <laughs> you know, and this, we just knew all those partners. And I'm thinking, we're not going to know this guy. He works with them the first day. Police car pulls up, and they walk. And that kid, this is officer, it is a uh, German name. This is officer so-and-so. Hi, officer so-and-so. I'm like, we're actually meeting this guy. And he and my dad got along really well, and he was part of our family, right? But here is, here is what's really curious about it. The integration took place, as far as I can see, and I really need to do a little bit more research on this, but I'm sure if I ask the older officers, they'll tell me I'm right. The integration took place not where they were, were patrolling, right? So my dad still worked in the black community. It's just that this white officer had to work in the black community now too. And do you look at that as, okay, we're integrating the crews, we're trying to make things better socially on the police department, get people to understand and know each other better? Or are we punishing this white officer? <laughs> yeah. How does that look, you know? So that was a very interesting times, but I do know this. I do know this. Their black police unionism that was going on throughout the country, it started in Chicago. There is still existing a National Black Police Officers Association where the local um, units, local organizations belong to a bigger unit and they have more political clout that way. They can get some things done. You're starting to see that turn around now again, where you're having black officers in your organizations starting to become more involved. Um, at the time, when they uh, started the group, it was called the Afro, Afro American Patrolmen's League, AAPL for short. The name has been changed. It's now African American Police, because there's women now. Right. Police League in Toledo, Ohio. So we changed that not too long ago. But the thing is this, their activism led the way to the next period, the next era. And the next era is the emergence of African-American police administrators from 1970 to the present, right? So because they uh, were able to push um, city founders and, excuse me, city leaders and the chiefs to change things, then you have this ascendancy of African-American police officers into the upper ranks. Here's a great example. Our first black deputy chief is Ron Jackson. He was appointed a year before the league was um, formed. But he is, he benefited from that, right? So he became a sergeant in 1976. He gets promoted to the rank of a lieutenant in 82. Two years later, he's a captain. And another two years, he's a deputy chief. And if you remember earlier, I said the way the ranks work, chief, deputy chief, captains, lieutenant, sergeants. So at this point in time, as a deputy chief, there's only one person on the police department that can tell him what to do. He, conversely, can tell a whole bunch of people what to do at the rank of deputy chief. And that's important. That's important. We need representation matters because Deputy Chief Jackson became a mentor to me, right? So you saw my dad and these guys doing all this work up here. It benefits him, but it also benefited me and people like me because I came on in 1976 as a result of the federal consent decree, right? Me and one of my best friends, two black females in the class. We had more, they were a class of 36, two black females, Says six or seven black police officers. That was probably in six or seven Latino officers. Probably one of the most diverse classes up to that point. 
as a direct result of what these officers right here did yeah. in the federal consent decree. So because of that, I was able to be hired. I got promoted to the rank of sergeant. And I also got promoted to the rank of lieutenant. I was the first lieutenant, female lieutenant, on the Toledo Police Department. So that kind of work matters. You see, this era not only propelled Ron Jackson to deputy chief uh, status, but also Nate Ford, who came after him, and also an individual by the name of Derek Diggs. Derek Diggs came on in 1977, a year after me. I used to tease him about that all the time. <laughs> and he also was promoted all the way up to the rank of deputy chief. This storyboard was made before he was promoted to the rank of chief, and he became the first black police chief on TPD. Um, he served in that capacity for almost four years, and now he currently serves in that capacity in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, which right now he's probably loving it that down there. That sounds pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> that it is up here. But uh, those are the different uh, errors in how the errors of uh, black policing and black policing in, in, the, in the city of Toledo kind of parallels what's going on with the rest of the society. So as you look at um, the national news, and you see Latino police chiefs, Latino deputy uh, of sheriffs, right? Uh, throughout the country, not just here, or used to be here in Toledo, but throughout the country. That is because of all of this stuff that happened before. That, their history on those other police departments, Chicago, in Florida, it does not, it's not any different than what happened here. It is basically the same thing. And right now what you're seeing is it's, it is interesting to have a discussion about uh, policing and communities of color. And how do you look at what needs to be done? And, um, and how do you look at representation on these police departments? Because it is not an easy task to recruit for police officers, period. All right, it's not easy. I, I've led recruitment campaigns here, and it's not an easy thing. It is a little bit more difficult to recruit officers of color for a variety of reasons, a variety of reasons. Um, but we have now, as a result of the African American Police League, a program that mentors young people of color and others if they wanna become police officers. And because of their efforts, we have better representation in the last what, three or four police academy class that have come up because they have taught these individuals, they mentor them through the process, and that is something that active and retired police officers can do, African American police officers in particular, can do to make sure there's representation on the police department staff. So that's one of the things that they're trying to do right now. So, I'm basically done. Do you have any questions?